Hello again, everybody. My name is John D. Healy. I do a podcast. It's called It's Good to Talk. It sure is good to talk and it's good to listen. I always have interesting guests on. There is no exception. I'll come to Paul Finnegan in one minute when I do my little promos. My sponsors are Liffy Van Lines, the moving company here in New York City, and they've been going for 50 years, longer than the New York City Marathon, growing stronger and stronger and stronger. Fall season is coming in. Liffy never falls back. They always move forward. I always give a shout out to the Irish Examiner USA. That would be Paddy McCarthy. He has promised me tickets for races if I mention his name twice. That's the Irish Examiner USA. It's a great paper, and I keep up to date on events that are happening all over the city. So there are two of my main people I want to introduce to you and mention, and I want to get right to the guest, because we have a lot to talk about. Paul Finnegan is the president of the IBO, which is the Irish organization. And I've been a member, I think, since I had a certificate, well, 20 years, a long time ago. But I'm still with them, and they're one of my favorite networking groups here in New York City. I've been involved with other networking groups, IBO. Easy to join, not too expensive, but I won't let Paul Finnegan talk about that. And Paul wears other hats. Paul, welcome to It's Good to Talk. And let's start talking. Paul, where did you come out of? Hey, John. John, thanks thanks for inviting me on your show and the opportunity to say, uh, say a few words and talk about a couple of things that are near and dear to me. So, yeah, my... Um, my background is actually a little unusual, but also more common than you might realize. I was actually born in the United States. I was brought back to Ireland as a as a as an infant, actually a baby, a baby in swaddling clothes, I like to say. And uh, I was raised in Galway City. And my people are primarily from Galway on both my mother and father's side. Although there's a branch of the family that's strongly Cork based, so we have that. And um, and <clears throat> my mother she raised in Kilkenny. So I have a, have, a, have a few flavors to Ireland in my background, but primarily I see myself as a Galwegian. Primarily on top of that, I see myself as a native to Galway City, which is a fantastic city. Yeah. And I, this expression, you know, I came to New York pretty much right after I got out of college, the college in Galway, UCG, it was called time, came Newey Galway, and then it became like Galway University or something. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't a good time in the 1980s. I came over to New York at that stage to live, and I've lived here since. And so I like to say I traded one great city for another. Because well, I, I always my favorite. Always my favorite of all the okay. cities because I went, went there for college. All Wait, right. Actually, one of my professors, Michael B. Higgins, the president of the now, he taught me straight with me social studies. Observed, observed the Higgins. But it was very pleasant. He was a pleasant man. And he, he treated us like students, because you were students. And he didn't get too carried away. Well, sometimes with the poetry. Well, it's good you bring up Michael D. Because um, my father actually was, when we went back to Ireland, he took a job in the college there. He knew Michael D. as a, as a fellow academic in the college. And they were friends. And my, my parents and he and his wife, the first lady of Ireland, uh, Sabina, I believe is her name, would... would Ten social events together and such. Yeah, small world, John. Small world indeed. The world is like a village. You can it. The global village really is a small village. So to continue with you, Paul, before we get to the IBO, which I do want to get to, is so you came here and you got involved. You want to get a job, get an apartment. The usual routine, job, apartment, one month wages paid for one month rent. That's the way it was when I got here. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, well, thankfully, and I'm not so sure it's such a strong thing anymore, but there was always an aunt or an uncle or cousin, oh, yeah. first cousin once remote that had a sofa for you. I'm not so sure how strong that connection is, and I can certainly go into those and those things because, you know, I'm, I work very closely on the Irish immigration scene in New York City while I've been here over the years. Um, but that was my story. Um, an aunt in Park Slope, Brooklyn, nice area. It's been downhill ever since, I might add. But uh, she she put me up, and uh, through her and other cousins, I got jobs. I started off going out to I went out to Long Island for about six months, uh, and um, being you know being shall we say with a f- only a few dollars in my pocket, I didn't have a car, and it was a hard place to live out there without a car. So I came back into the city after a few months and got into the the, the local apartment scene, and that meant sharing with people. You know, you'd have you'd have four or four or six people in an apartment sometimes a lot more let me tell you but uh, i generally seem to have about somewhere between four and eight people in the apartment i lived in 
And uh, and then there was all sort of weird things that maybe we've forgotten about now. But uh, you'd have to you'd have to have a look at the good look at the phone bill every month, see who owed what on the phone what? bill. You know how many calls are made to Ireland and who made them. Good. And things like, you know, the gas and and, uh, and the electric and such. And then you'd have somebody move out and you'd, uh, I know you had this whole thing with the deposit and making sure everybody got squared away and all that stuff. So I went through that for a few years and I got I got tired of that after about six years. So I just started well, living. Well, when the milk carton has no milk in it, you're saying yes. who was the last factor that used the last pot of milk and didn't replace well, your food in the fridge. Your, <laughs> your food in the fridge. Forget about it. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I got tired of that whole, you know, shall we say, vol- volatile environment, unstable environment. So I started living on my own, and you know, I couldn't afford much more than studio apartments for a couple of years, and that was grand, you know. And then, and then, York City. And, and time went down anyway. I mostly lived, I've lived pretty much always in Queens, except for a few weeks in Manhattan and those months in Long Island and a few weeks in Brooklyn, but generally speaking, Queens, Woodside, Sunnyside. Oh, yeah, that's good. And then I found my way to Glendale, and uh, and that's, you know, and recently I've, I've moved into Maspeth, actually. So, so you know, most of my time was many, many years in Glendale. So, so anyway, um, Met my wife, who's still my wife, uh, along the way those years. So we we got married in a house and raised kids and so on in Glendale. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the accommodation story, anyway. Jimmy, get ready to sing a song for us shortly. Jimmy's going to sing a song for us. Um, so now move on to more or less some of the hats you you wear. I, I don't want to go back over your summer jobs because sure, much the same. Like you like between the moving companies. It was always summer jobs. Everyone had a summer job, especially during July and August. Lots of funny stories there. But you, yeah. you, I, what you, your, your experience? Well, my, my, uh, let, let's, let's, let's uh, euphemistically call it my professional experience, you know. But uh, so I was fortunate enough to come to America as a college graduate. I was fortunate enough to have U.S. citizenship through birth. I was fortunate enough to have English, even though I've certainly learned a lot of Spanish in the meantime, my wife being a Spanish lady herself. I learned, you know, but, but, you know, I had all those things going for me. And I, so I, I worked for a few years in, in the field of engineering, actually, mostly doing, uh, project work around Manhattan in construction sites had to do with air conditioning and heating, but I, I really didn't enjoy that very much. And one of the things I always loved about America, or maybe maybe it's more specifically to New York, you can just change course anytime you want. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, and I've I've actually done that quite a bit over the course of my career. No. Well, you know, the, yeah, the expression that I use is I specialize in career changes. You know, that was kind of what yeah. I used to say for a while. But I went from that, and then I decided I wasn't really happy in the engineering world so i went into uh, public school teaching actually and i taught public school here in new york city for several years but like, along, more than this, yeah. yeah yeah and i love that it's one of the greatest experiences of my life but um one of the things i i knew was i didn't want to do it for the course of my career or the link to my my working life so I studied at night at Baruch College in Manhattan and got a degree. And I was very taken with the internet. This is going back when the internet was just about beginning to be a thing. You know, the World Wide Web, websites, all that stuff. So I took to that. And, um, you know, I, I was always, I was always enjoyed computer programming and things like that, writing code and stuff. So I took a master's at Baruch in, um, in information systems and business and things like that. But, foundation information systems so then i jumped into that career for about let's say i was in it for about 15 years excellent and pete took it a while so so actually i i left out a big part of my career there just just as my public school teaching days were coming to an end i got to run a place called the emerald isle immigration center for about four years that's the executive director yes, there sir. that's a fairly well-known organization oh, yeah. currently under the leadership of siobhan dennehy good friend of mine yeah, no, yeah. But yeah, uh, so I, I, I sort of, one of the things I wanted to say was community work always kind of went in parallel on, on a different frequency to my quote unquote day job. Wow. I found, I found growing up in Galway, even though I love Galway and I loved Galway as a place to grow up in, I always felt like being Irish wasn't something that you really celebrated. Then mm. I came to New York and I found that the, I just felt how 
how, how successful the Irish have been yeah. in this country and what they have done to make this a great country. And I felt a real pride and I felt, I felt a broader community of Irish here more strongly than I felt in Ireland. And that included people from the north, the six counties. Oh, yeah, sure. We were basically, for a, to a large extent, cut off from that world because of the yeah. uh, troubles, the situation, oh, the war situation. So I got to know people from Derry and Belfast and Tyrone and Antrim uh, for the very first time, you know, and I really felt like, well, gosh, Paul, you know, I, Paul, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I totally, totally, you're 100% right and all that. And I'm sure you'll agree with me. When, when we got here as well, of course, we have similarities, was our Irish American cousins, like, it, like they were eager to meet us because they only had a voice from Grandpair. And they'd say, Where are you from? I'm from Galway. I'm from Mayo. Well, my mother's from Galway. My father is from Kerry. And they wanted that connection and they wanted to help you. They really to be a source of unity, as you call it. Did you find that for sure? It, it, that was a, that's what sort of layered into my new pride in being Irish. I mean, the, you could you know it was infectious. My cousins, uh, many of them had visited Ireland, and I had met them growing up over the years. To see to see them in their natural habitat oh. and St Patrick's Day being such oh. a center of this pride and the oh. I remember the first time going to the St Patrick's Day parade and seeing the huge huge crowds on, on a weekday. The only the only yeah. group that don't do that on a weekday, you know. So yeah. all of that played into it. And the, and the, I say that, and we we'll talk about the IBO along the way as well. But one of the things I say to people who come to our meetings that are, shall we say, recently arrived from Ireland, you know, unlike anything you've experienced before, not just because you're Irish, but primarily in this context, we want you to succeed. Yes. And we, we can't help you. Right. What you may be, you may be more used to an environment where people are trying to knock you down, but well, here. It generally will lift you up. Now, we can't do everything. We're not miracle workers, but we will make every effort right. to see your success. And I, I think that that, trans, that that is a lot of what America is very, about. Very, important. Celebrate now, I'm, helping, I'm helping Jimmy Grady with his career. When I met him first, I think he was 10. Then he got to be 11 years old. He'll soon be older than me or he'll be older than Joe Biden. Jimmy, can you do a song for us? Whatever song you want to do. Everyone wants Caledonia. Tony King is a listener. He thinks Jimmy's version of Caledonia right. is better than Dolores King. Well, I'd like to get Dolores King's opinion on that. And if she says Jimmy is better than she is, and Tony King says, Jimmy, come on, we're going to sing a song. Okay. By a lonely prison wall, I hear the young girl calling. Michael, I have taken. See the morn. Now a prison ship lies waiting in the bay. Lie the fields of Athen Rye, where once we watch the small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing. We had dreams and songs to sing. It's so lonely around the fields of Athen Rye. By a lonely prison wall, I heard a young man calling. Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free. Against the famine, the crown. I rebelled, they cut me down. Now you must raise our child with dignity. Hello, in the fields of Athen Rye, where once we watch the small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing, we had dreams and songs to sing. It's so lonely around the fields of Athen Rye. By a lonely harbor wall, she watched.
watch the last star falling as the prison ship sailed out against the sky for she lived in hope and pray for her love in botany bay it's so lonely round the fields of Athenry Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of Athenry It's so lonely round the fields of Athenry Okay, I'm back. Thank you, Jimmy, for a great song again. I'm back with Paul Finnegan, my guest today, president of the IBO, Irish business organization here in York City. If you don't know about it, you should know about it. And if you know about it, you want to learn more about it. Membership fees, what to do, and many events. So, Paul, back to you to explain all about. Certainly, yeah. I, I'm in my third year as president of the Irish business organization. I won't be running again next year. I, I, I'm going to hand off the reins to other people that hopefully will continue the the, uh, the work we've been doing. But the IBO itself um, is a network of that would primarily describe themselves as entrepreneurial and on some level, although many, many members do work for corporations and work for other people. But I think we I think the organization has always filled a niche in the community for this for the smaller guy, the sole proprietor. The guy who has a, his own book of business, and maybe a little bit bigger than that at times, you know. I think mm-hmm. once once companies get to a certain um, scale, you know, mm-hmm. the IBO becomes something they look to as something that helps them on the way to their success. And we we, we had our fiftieth celebration last year, well, and there. a lot a lot of um, great people who had been members in years past came out for our gala at Chelsea Piers last October. So that was just, uh, we have, let me say, we have an extensive, what is it, an extensive alumnus, an extensive oh, yeah. alumni going back. Again, it's a 51-year-old organization now. So it started off as basically a bunch of um, insurance guys getting together to share, you know, information across the community. Remember, this was long before you know, anything like email, let yeah. alone anything on a, on a smartphone. Uh, the phone was about all you could get to at that point, and nobody had mobile phones. So this was a way for communications to take place. Right. And that's how it started. And originally, they were sort of a little bit, um, shall we say, non-inclusive. There was no, right. the girls weren't allowed in, the women weren't allowed. And also, if you weren't born in Ireland, if you weren't natively born to Ireland, you couldn't join either. So I would have been excluded. But there were some great glass ceiling smashers going around, and you can never keep. You can never. Mm-hmm. Bernadette McManus is a woman who was. She's a past president of the IBO, but someone I got to know very well through the through the history. I I studied the history of the IBO along the way, and um, got to know Bernadette. She basically she basically uh, she got into meetings because she was allowed in to take take the minutes. You see, and. From there on in, anyway, her forceful go-getter personality forced them to vote uh, to allow women to join and then to allow anybody to join, basically. And we, we've since expanded that to be a very inclusive organization. I just want to say something about organizations right. that carry the label Irish. You know, we have, I was, I was head of the New York Irish Center for quite a number of years, but that Irish doesn't mean it's only for Irish. It means it's Irish in spirit, that it's yep. about welcoming, the welcoming, the Irish welcoming. We have a lot of stereotypes as a people, you know, obviously alcohol is one of them and, and other other stereotypes. But I'll tell you, some of the best parts of Ireland, the best best stereo the most truest stereotypes about the Irish include the welcome, also and also the sense of justice. So there's well, I need to mention that. So anyway, the IBO, I became a member in the nineties, on and off membership over the years. There were times where my work took me out of the city. It was hard for me to get to meetings, but I knew some great people over the last, you know, thirty odd years now. Towards uh around to about was it four or five years ago, John Lee John Lee invited me onto the board and I came on as VP. And then he stepped aside of his presidency from his presidency. And I, I stepped in as president. Mm-hmm. That's where we are. And, you know, every age, every time, every chapter is different. So over the years, 
the IBO went from a group that might have catered primarily to ins- people dealing in insurance and real estate and connecting and so on to people, you know, developing a book of business in construction, you know, all and, and any, you know, people with, you know, startup mentalities in any field, you know, retail, all kinds of, so it's been suitable at, you know, and it, it's, it's a very social environment and a very, you know, not clickish mm. social environment, you know, mm. so when people come to our meetings, it's not like, um, I know there's, there's a networking group that I, you know, very global networking group. It's very much like speed dating. You go in and you see who's oh, there. Yeah and stuff like that ours is to get the best benefit of the ibo is you come and you stay you know you come to meet on and off over time i think you might have experienced that john yeah, my, my earliest member is uh the owner of time dan maloney an award from the ibo yeah the president then i think was sean mcnicholas so i must have been about 20 years old at the time maybe uh that's a that's a long time ago it's a long, long time ago. So it goes back far. And you're right about the the changes along the way, the diversity, the broader the networking and the willingness, as you said, is to help other people. Like I met, for example, I met Robert Walsh there and his assistant, Lewis, from yeah. the Bronx Economic Development Community in the Bronx. Yes. I was there when you had Senator Mitchell as a speaker. So mm-hmm. I made great connections along the way. Mm-hmm. But I am that type of person, say, and they, I go off and tell me this one time, I, I take the good bits out and I, I ignore the bad bits, just like eating a meal. Well, she would say that, wouldn't she? She, of course she would. Well, <laughs> anyways, I'm not talking about my extractions anymore. Well, tell me more about, you, more about the me meeting and how do you join? I know you have global membership now. Yeah. Yeah. The global membership came out of the pandemic, but basically regular membership is a very affordable $125 oh, yeah. a year. You get to come to our, uh, most of our meetings without any, any, any fee, you know, so we have regular monthly meetings and we also have a, every other month now we have the breakfast. And, yeah. You pay for the breakfast, you know, I mean, that, that you, I mean, but it's a, it's subsidized, you know, it's, I, I mm-hmm. forget exactly what the price is, but we pay more. No, for nothing. Right. And we have other events too, where we subsidize, um, we subsidize, if you're a member, you get a better price. So we've done nights at the Upturn Center, things like that. And we've had great crack, as they say, doing different things. And, um, but that's the social aspect of it, you know, um, we, we have other levels of membership, uh, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get to the, I'll get to the main one I want to talk about, but your international membership that, that occurred, or that arose a lot from the pandemic, basically. Okay. And John, John Dilley, my, my predecessor was uh, very quick to get us online when the, right. when the, when the, when the, uh, when the, um, when, the um, when it all fell apart in March 2020, right. we discovered we had people overseas that had either lived in New York or just an affinity with New York. And, uh, we have, a, we have a regular, um, Virtual breakfast meeting with with everyone, everyone. But we get yeah. we get our international people coming in. Oh. Then and their membership is only seventy five dollars because they don't get to avail other things. Yeah. Um, but the other membership I want to talk about is you know we talk about all all organizations be they for profit or not for profit they have to have a reason to be there. They have to be serving some need. Like Liffy Liffy moves people right. What the IBO do, you know? And as far as I can tell, Liffy will has a reason to be there, which won't go away. People will always be wanting to move and have yes. kids. So, so, so the IBO has to think about where it is on the landscape of community always, you know, and adapt to what the needs are. So oh. that's the other needs we meet, which is basically, um, the established, uh, small business community being able to connect, socialize and have support. And we have programs for those as well. There are the, and this is a system of, uh, a system at, um, this is something like the immigration scene, you know, is very restrictive now. But what we have is very few programs where people from anywhere, Ireland including, can come to the United States and be legal here. And most right. of those opportunities are short term, you know, right. But for the Irish, there's one that they're very, uh, they use a lot. It's the J1 graduate program right. where they can be as graduates and they can stay. Up to eight months, but they That's have right. a they have a very difficult um, 
criteria to stay beyond three months, and that is they have to have a job. In any situation, looking for a job is a process. It's yes. a full job in and of itself. So we've developed a program at the IBO, which is now collaboratively um, ex- it's extended to other organizations in the city. Everyone was doing it, but nobody was channeling it all into right. one efficient group. So the IBO, I think, took the lead, and it did take the lead. And now we've had other groups that went behind it, especially a partner with us, especially Emerald Isle and Digital Irish and other and, and some great individuals as well. Some people in this in our community have have huge personal brands, but they're always working on behalf of the community. And I'll just say, and I want to say this, John, we lost Adrian Flannelly just about well, yeah, we, yeah. he would have been typical of the kind of person I'm talking oh, about. Yeah, he, was from another, he was from another era, as I will be too. And but the great people so we're we're aggregating around a program called the Graduate Gate, which okay. is a way to help our, what I call our newest business arrivals, our newest biz- members of our business community, those coming in from Ireland on the J1 graduate visa program, looking to establish, you know, a foothold in their careers by having some experience right. and American experience, New York yeah. experience. So we are, we are, we are doing things on several fronts. We try yeah. to educate them before they get here on simple things like CV versus a resume. You know, what the cost of living is in New York. Like, okay, they've been to New York with their parents. They stayed in a nice hotel in Times Square, but they weren't paying the bill. Once they get here and they get the sticker shock of apartment. I must commend your team. You have a great team around you. Beautiful. Thank you. I, I must say that. That presentation, young people, I'm sure they can go back and find it again before yeah. they get here. Do's and don'ts. And to know the set stuff, the CV, resume, what should be on, what shouldn't be on, how to show up for you, and what you do, how you present yourself. But your team, you are you a better team than any team, I think, in terms of whole organization. Uh, I think so. I, well, thank you, John. I, I don't think, but I think it's great to hear it from you. But I will say this. I have been very blessed and fortunate to find individuals to work with me on the board at the IBO. And, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just finding people with the right are coming to the right place, the right attitude. Their heart is in the right place, and they're willing. They're willing to put some effort into it. Yeah. And I think it's. I think it's been paying off. We get a lot of well, testimony of really. kids that have yeah. um, gotten jobs, are able to stay in the states, and they have to leave after three months. And there have been a couple. I think we've lost most. Most it works out for most of them. And I, I tell them, look, you know, if there's one thing about America that you get for free, it's probably the only thing you get for, for free in America is optimism. Yeah. So just stay positive. Like yourself, I wear more hats than just working for Liffey. Because yeah. just yeah. the net of Liffey oh, is huge. Yeah. Liffey's been yeah. 50 years. Yes. And yes. Come every week, every day. And there's always opportunities, not just lifting furniture. I always say that Liffey, lifting, look, there's administration jobs, there's office jobs, there's computer jobs. There's more to Liffey than meets the eye. But getting, getting back to the eye well, Tell us a little bit more how people that are new to the IBO now, they're saying, we never heard of it. Or I mean, I met people three months ago and said, oh, there's no women allowed there. I said, you're thinking about some other organizations. Yeah. You're thinking of maybe the AOH or something. You're confusing things. And then I said, no, they accept everybody and anybody with any connection, with any love for Ireland. And another yeah. woman wants to know, would I meet a man there? I said, you could possibly meet your future husband there. You know, who knows? It's not working. You're not in, you can't win, as they say. You That's know, true. you got to get out there in one way, shape, or form for whatever yeah, you present to yourself. the world. And the IBO is uh, a really good forum to introduce to meet people and interact with people. And I've met people that have been on my podcast. Mm-hmm. For example, the smuggling nun was on here. She promotes a, 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 like a tequila thing or whatever. It kill you. Well, we had a good conversation about it. But it reminded me of real punching that we that we had back in Mayo on the hills of and the hills of Donegal Wall as well. Anyways, I met people, so many people, so many good friends through the IBO. I can I can only say all good things about the IBO. Thank you, how John. Do connect, how do people connect? Or if they don't know the IBO, I always say put in Irish Business Organization. If it doesn't come up as IBO, everyone yeah. is not brilliant with the computer, you know. Yeah, but you get the article if you want to get it. Just look under events, and um, you're welcome to come along to events. And uh, 
people, you know, you're welcome to, you're welcome to email me at president at New York, sorry, president at IBO New York dot org, or you can send an email to our general mailbox if you have any questions, info at IBO New York dot org. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to have you come along as my guest. I'd be saying to them, look up the events and yeah. go to an event. No one's going to kick you out because you're not a member. It's just put your toe in the water and see if you like, and see if you like the people. And you'll know if it's for you. You'll know if it's for you right away. And if it's for you, it's for you. $125 for the year is four events, evening events, morning events, subsidized events. Yes. And let, let's talk about the St. Patrick's Day parade. I mean, that is a huge success. In itself, yeah, anyone can march with us on St. Patrick's Day. We have this, we have a great after party, not it's far into the parade. I call it the world-renowned after party, you know. Is. But we we had to put it, we had to put it on ice through the pandemic, but we brought it back as soon it's as back. we could. And uh, it's 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 you know, it's the best way to. It's a really nice way to spend St. Patrick's Day. There are obviously lots of great things happening on St. Patrick's Day. No, I enjoy it. Been- March of the Sligo crowd shop, the Dublin crowd shop, the yeah. Norway crowd shop, I mean, all crowd shop. Yeah. You know, little group pockets of everyone. Yes. Because it's good to talk. That's yes. the podcast, by the way. And if you like this podcast, just hit subscribe, it's free. And if you like other podcasts, I also shout out sometimes to John Lee and Mark Nutty Dyer Stu. They have a, a podcast too, similar approach to myself, but we can't all hang our clothes in the same clothesline. I tune into some of their stuff. The bits I like again, and the bits I don't like, I say, okay, let me check out something else. Anything else you'd like to finish up on, Paul, before oh, we forgot one good thing? You have a huge event come up in October. Yes, personally, I do. Yeah. Chick Children is a wonderful organization, and they were very instrumental in, in uh, creating the platform for peace in the north of Ireland. Their founder, Dennis Mulcahy, retired member of the NYPD Bomb Squad, set up Project Children, by, well, 50 years ago, actually. So that wow. would be early 70s brought kids from ireland every year catholic and protestant kids but the protestants in catholic houses but the catholic kids in protestant houses and just created an and a lot of them went back to ireland grew up and became advocates for a better solution you know and i think that all you know it all grassroots kind of seeped through into the into the halls of power in dublin belfast and london so project children are celebrating uh, 50 years next year what they're going to do is um, create an archive in the town of Monaghan, Peace okay. Camps in Monaghan. So right. the project is called, or the initiative is called Move to Monaghan, and there is a K run on October 20th at Rockland GAA, right. and you can run and picnic. You don't have to run. You can just spend the whole time at the bar if you want, although we would encourage you to stretch your legs and have oh, a good the chef kids and picnics and everything i'm an ambassador for the project so i'm building a team uh, i'd love if anyone listening to your 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 podcast today john would well, go on projectchildren.org type me and sign up for my team it's a 50 dollar uh, investment but it is a fundraiser for wow. this move to man and initiative uh, it's a great day for the family mm-hmm. and uh, really would love if uh love you join my team there's a number of teams but uh, there's 10 ambassadors and, and sponsors and other groups. But uh, um, as an ambassador, I would love to have a good, healthy bunch of people and gather. I will add that to you from my listeners. If they go on IBO and go on to the events, when they scroll down there a little bit, you did a little YouTube presentation of it, and you did it very well. So if you didn't grasp it now, today, you can go back into IBO.org, look at events, and scroll down, and that's coming up. October the 20th. Yes. And this is why I wanted to do this podcast early gotcha. now, which you call. So we get the word sooner, you know? Yes. Big push in September to get this done, and, and uh, I appreciate your help in spreading the word. Oh, it's good to talk. It is. Paul, I'm going to say, and I always sign off in Irish, my Irish language. I said, yeah, that means that's a story. And now we go out with the European national anthem. And I'll say, thank you, Paul, for all your help along the years, and good luck going forward and good luck with the Monaghan moved moved Monaghan project. That's a big project. She will. Son. Slon.